Hi everyone, you caught me having a sip of tea there. Uh, this is Henry Hyde, and uh, you probably know me from my association with Battle Games, and then Miniature War Games with Battle Games, author of the Wargaming Compendium, uh, and now running my own Battle Games gig on Patreon. And of course, I'd love you to come over to patreon.com slash battle games and become a patron yourself. That would be marvellous. But anyway, why am I here? Because it should have been the other partisan this weekend. I'm actually recording this on the evening of Saturday the 10th of October 2020. The other partisan would have been tomorrow, Sunday the 11th of October 2020. Um, and what a great shame it is that because of the COVID-19 pandemic situation, the guys, Tricks and Lawrence, have had to cancel uh, this, the autumn show, as well as the spring show. Uh, and you may recall that I did a long rambling thing for the May Partisan. And so I'm back again. The guy said, oh, you can't possibly do this. You've just, you're recovering from cancer. You're, you know, you're tired and all the rest of it. But I feel very strongly that I want to support the Partisan shows because I've really enjoyed them over the years that I've been visiting them and I think as I said it's a real shame that uh, it's not happening you know for this show either so whatever you know crikey I can cobble something together so I've had a bit of a head scratch and I thought what can I do what can I do that would be uniquely me and I thought um imaginations let's talk about imaginations um which are astonishingly popular these days obviously first of all emerged way way long ago in the dawn of time in the wargaming hobby people like charles grant tony bath and others who either adapted real countries like charles grant took um austria and france of the Seven Years' War and turned them into the Grand Duchy of Lorraine. And he took Prussia and its allies and turned them into Die Vereine zu Freierstädte. This was back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, it's in recent years, certainly, I think when I launched Battle Games in 2006 and on the front cover there was a load of Spencer Smith marching off to war um, representing some of my own imaginary countries that sort of lit a bit of a flame and uh, along with the old school wargaming group uh, that had started on yahoo a year or two before that um, imagination started to experience a massive resurgence and that has continued which is wonderful um, so I'm going to talk a bit about imaginations and about the kind of things that, um, you know, you can do with imaginations and why you might want to start an imagination and how you can develop and grow an imagination or imaginations, how you can map them, think about clothing your figures, that kind of thing. Uh, so I intend to be chatting for about an hour, but this is me we're talking about, so it might go on a bit longer, which is why I have a stock of drinks to soothe my throat uh, beside me. So let's, <clears throat> I'm going to start by going back to the, the dawn of time almost, as far as I'm concerned, when um, I started planning my own imaginations uh, none of this that i'm going to talk about today is remotely prescriptive right this is just how i've done things and i along the way i might mention some other people and their stuff but this purely with luck you, you might find some find something i talk about of interest and you might go oh actually i'll give that a try in your own way okay the whole point of imaginations in particular is it's a very personal take on wargaming it's a very personal take on whatever period of history you choose or you know it's imaginations are so close there's a you know a kind of a crossover between what we think of imaginations that are largely historically based at least and of course fantasy and science fiction depending on where you go uh you know that line between them can be quite blurry
So, you know, as it as it crops up, I might talk about that. OK, so I'm going to open a picture here. I hope if it works. Uh, OK, uh, let's see if I get this to open in Adobe Photoshop. Now, hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, you can now see this thing that's opened in Adobe Photoshop. And what it shows, I'll zoom in a bit. No, I won't. I'll zoom out a bit and make it fill the frame. There we are. That's better. Uh, what you're looking at here is a thing I did on tracing paper many, many, many years ago. Uh, and I can see down here in the corner, just about see that that was sometime in 1989. Crikey. Uh, 31 years ago. Uh, back in the days before I had access to computers, <laughs> um, and you'll see later how you know the effect of computers and particularly my beloved Apple Mac have had on my ability to make maps. This was drawn by hand with mapping pens and it was as it was dedicated uh, <coughs> down the bottom um, to pour Guy, pour Henri, pour la gloire, uh, for my mate Guy, for me and for glory. There we are. This actually measures, I think it's kind of um, an A3 size piece of tracing paper, or maybe slightly bigger, um, drawn up into squares of, uh, I think that's each one of the big squares is about five centimeters. And you see there's actually a key down here uh, that says one millimeter equals one kilometer. And contours are at 500 meter intervals. And you've got borders and roads and woods with a dotted outline and cliffs, which are sort of ha uh, hashed. Um, and what you see here is my original kind of creation. Uh, I think before this, I literally, because I, I, I mentioned before, I think, that this whole thing uh, was actually born originally during my year abroad that I spent in Germany, in Augsburg in Germany, back in 1981-82, my second year at Sussex University, involved a year of a study year abroad. And whilst I was out there, I uh, it was pretty lonely and the winter was long and very cold with many feet of snow on the ground outside. And I was living in um, a chilly kind of shared apartment um, owned by a very strange man, I have to tell you. That was a story for another time. But I kind of started thinking, well, you know, I'm bored. What can I do? And I started tinkering with the idea of my own imaginations inspired by Charles Grant. And it, it started um, actually on paper with a, a little notebook, as I recall. It was actually, there were no, I didn't even draw any maps initially. I just started making making up some names of countries and royal families and having them do ridiculously stupid things and invading one another. And then, you know, I started doodling on paper and, you know, well, you know, what might this kind of world look like and who are the respective countries and roughly where are they positioned and so on. And that progressed to kind of some pencil drawn maps. And then obviously at some point when I got back to the UK in the late 80s, I started getting much more serious about it. Uh, I had an article published called Fictitious Wars in Miniature War Games. I think it was number 43 back in, ooh, I think that was 1986, um, where I had, you know, I, I talked about... Um, creating fictitious wars, fictitious countries, and so on. And then obviously at some point as well, you know, my mate Guy was getting involved and I decided it was time to properly map the geography of this place. And this was the first kind of major outing, uh, as I say, drawn initially in pencil and then inked over with mapping pens on tracing paper. The idea with tracing paper is as I expanded this world to east or west or north or south, I could just um, 
take more pieces of tracing paper and overlap them. Um, now, obviously, the advent of computers as things went on in the 90s and as I became a graphic designer, just a little did I know that just two years after this, I would become a graphic designer and have access to Apple Mac computers for the first time, very early Apple Mac computers. But um, that obviously completely transformed the possibilities. Um, but, you know, I still love getting out pencil, paper. I've got a thing about tracing paper. I always have. <laughs> weird isn't it i actually sometimes like to just draw stuff on tracing paper and and have that kind of over overlappy thing happen that's quite a fun way of expanding a world just is uh if i had a big flat wall that was big enough i'd probably you know have them permanently pinned up there take me back to churchill's war room you know in london uh something like that but anyway you can see in the center here You've got the well, uh, the southern half of the map is largely taken up by the Grossmeer, the big sea. Uh, doesn't take much imagination to do that with some islands, and uh, you've also got it right in the middle there. There's this river, the Sturmwasser, that divides, you know, it's running very neatly down that center line, pretty much waggling either side of it. So on the left to the uh, west you have Faltenland also known as Fauteur okay because um, Guy when he got involved he decided that they would speak French so uh, okay the Fauteur um, Faltenland it's a bit like Lorraine I think there's going to be a mixture of French and German speaking peoples in there um, so that's Fauteur Faltenland on the left and Pruntland of course the mighty Pruntland on the right now you can see way out on the right uh to the east you can see a border and the other side of the border is a place called boscht yes like the soup um which is obviously sort of russianish or, or ost european anyway uh way up the top there in the corner i can see i created a country called Lauendorf or something, which um, hasn't been developed really yet. Down in the bottom right hand corner, um, you have Bizarbia, about which we'll talk more later because that's become quite a thing, Bizarbia. Uh, it was just sort of, um, you know, Bizarbia, a mixture of Byzantium and Arabia. Okay, uh, top centre we have the little enclave, the little electorate of Martinstadt, which has a story of its own, as you'll see. Above that you have Schmeisberg Dornau, nice juicy Germanic name. To the left of that we have Schwitz, which is like Switzerland, that actually means sweat, <laughs> right? Um, then over to the east. Um, two places that really took on a life of their own in more recent years again as you'll see uh, Grand Nuis and Grand Prix um, and so that was the start of this world and as you can see I got went into some detail with uh, contours and with you know forested areas with roads and so on and so forth plenty of p potential dispute down that river line in the center there of uh, the Sturmwasser. if i get the the mouse and waggle it down the line there you can see oh that was just ripe for trouble okay and so it turned out to be in the initial campaigns with my friend guy um what drives one to do this I suppose you could say insanity. Um, but actually, at the time, it was uh, a love of two things. A love of maps. I've always loved maps. Always loved maps. And a fascination with how maps are drawn. And obviously, over the years, I've developed uh, different ways, different techniques of portraying geography and geology but i just yeah you know, i look at that and i think oh it's not like this this is i find it very pleasing um and so maps and languages 
um, because as I mentioned, when I started this, I was doing my year abroad in Augsburg in Bavaria. And so I was becoming quite fluent in German and also uh, was mixing with people of all kinds of nationalities, practicing my French quite often, Italian, although Italian doesn't really appear on here, uh, other than potentially Grand Prix, but there's another story there. But certainly the Germanic kind of languages and, and the mix there uh, really excited me. And that's also, you know, goes back to, you know, Charles Grant's Die Vereinigte Freie Städte, you know, the United Free States. Um, yes, I think that's what turned me on. Now, in your case, I'm not saying you have to get out tracing paper, rule it up by hand as I did. Uh, I think I actually, um, I did have a draftsman's board, you know, one of those things you still can get them, I think, where uh, it's like a big board kind of A2 size or that sort of dimensions, uh, like, in other words, like two feet by three feet, something like that size, with um, a kind of metal channel up one side and there's a, a big ruler that clicks into that for your horizontal lines and you can slide it up and down uh, and also what clips into that is it has a groove in it itself and there's another ruler clips into that for your vertical lines so you can automatically get stuff at a proper right angle and I'd invested in one of those I seem to remember crikey yes this would have been in the after I finished my degree and got home. So this would have been in the mid late 80s. And I think it was quite expensive. <laughs> I think it was kind of in back then in the sort of ouch hundred pound territories, pro pro professional draftsman's board. Um, but it was a treat to myself. And I've never regretted it actually, because that board uh, ended up being home to not just of my map making, but a lot of calligraphy. I used to, I was in a medieval reenactment society, used to do a lot of calligraphy, um, making scrolls, you know, on vellum, gold leaf, illumination, all that kind of stuff. So it paid its way, that's for sure. And um, yeah, that's how I managed to get all these nice right angled lines without smudges. Um, Back in the day. So anyway, that, ladies and gentlemen, is an introduction to the birth of my own two imaginations, Fountainland and Prunkland, with a few bits around the edges that I hadn't thought about really or developed at all, because I saw the centre of operations between myself and my mate Guy being kind of right here in this uh, area that I'm sort of circling here, with some naval action you know, nicking islands from one another. Um, and we were, that was the plan. It was going to be sort of contained within this sort of area. Uh, and I think we were even going to circumscribe how much exploration we would do outside this area of the map, simply knowing back then uh, how much work it might entail. But anyway, that's, that's that first picture. Now, what I'm going to do, if I can find it, I've got another picture here. Yes, of when I, you know, we had thoughts about, oh, how are we going to do map movement and that kind of stuff? And the decision was made that it was all going to be controlled, uh, you know, adjudicated using hexes. So uh, I found some hex paper somewhere. And back in those days, we photocopied it. Um, and I drew, redrew the map to configure with the hexes. So you can see uh, that here we've got, um, that's the river Sturmwasser, I believe it is. It's labeled there in Biro back in the day. So with, uh, yes, just with Biros or you know, ink pens over the top of this kind of photocopied hex sheet, I laid on all the contours indicated using what are known as fleshes here these little lines that run from the high ground to the low ground and if you're really really skilled and got the right pen you can make that flesh thicker at, on, at the high ground end and taper off to be a lot thinner at the low ground end i think looking at this this might have been done with like a a 
fiber tip mapping pen or something so they don't taper as much as i would like but never mind you get the idea and there's that river storm Wasser going down the middle with now some labeled cities on so we have bernau right on the border there we have a great name here hagenhuen limburg uh, we have Immenstadt down here, Langenagen, Oberdorf, um, Kaufburg. Now, some of these place names I need to point out because you'll think, God, how do you come up with all these names? Well, some of them are just made up in my head. Some of them are kind of wordplay on Germanic words. Some of them are real place names. Uh, I bought a map of Central Europe, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and um, that map came with a full kind of index of place names, thousands of them running from, you know, big cities all the way down to the tiniest little villages that were marked on the map. And so I just nicked some names um so uh, big cities may actually have pinched names that belong really to tiny little villages in the middle of nowhere um i sometimes would take a real place name and just jumble it up a bit um sometimes i would take a real place name and tag a fictitious prefix or suffix on it it's just i had fun just making up these names and so um borrowing you know, some real place names or region names and turning them into, you know, my place names. Why not? Why not? You know, you, you, you get your inspiration where you can. And in this case, obviously, I've used German, Austrian, Swiss kind of place names. You might be looking at France, Belgium, Netherlands, that kind of area and do the same thing. Um, it's not hurting anyone. You're not breaching any... <laughs> copyright i don't think there is copyright on place names because obviously there are certain places that appear several times all around the world um i mean you've got the americans are always very careful to say london england because i believe there's a london or more than one london over on in the states um so here we go so there's some nice juicy names I, you know when it comes to german i like german because you can kind of really get your teeth around things so drachensburg uh, and the capital incident the capital of Pungland. i'm pointing with my finger i need to point with my mouse don't i so you can see i'm waggling it biebersfurt that's the capital of Pungland. uh philipsburg Kleeborn, neinburg some of these actually Kleeborn, i seem to remember is just um it's the name of a bit of augsburg one of the areas of the city of augsburg Kleeborn. i think you can catch a tram from the center of augsburg to Kleeborn. there you go or used to be able to do. um you know max hütte feel ritzhausen coburg lutzelbuch uh lovely I love some of these place names. So there we are. So um, then the woods forests are denoted this time with these little dotted hexes. Roads are obviously these kind of dotted lines. So that was the first attempt at putting stuff into a hex map format. Now, um, I, I, we just worked out that it was far, far easier to just do things. You can see the coordinates here. So uh, on the left-hand side, we've got A to HH. And along the top, we've got 1 to... <laughs> what's that? 53. The numbers have got cut off at the top because of photocopying or scanning or something. Um, so that's how it turned out. So Bieber's foot is in... Where are we? Um uh a b c d e f g h uh 49 is B Bieber's foot that's how it works so that you know for those of you who are neat and tidy the trouble with the previous let me uh, reopen let me reopen this you know with their lovely squares and everything looking very perhaps slightly more in inverted commas realistic as a map but actually trying to pin down the precise coordinates of a unit in a system like this 
you know so what would this be this would be uh, uh, down here let's have a look where the, the this town on the coast is that is uh, uh, a B C D E so that's E um, one two three four five six seven E seven that square but of course then you're already thinking oh to make it easier to pinpoint stuff we've subdivided that so it's E seven one two three or E7C or whatever. Um, it's much trickier unless you've got an umpire who has this as their master map and is tracking precisely where things are and whether they bump into each other. Whereas here, using hexes immediately for my campaign rules, it became so much simpler because each of these hexes, I think I said, is about five miles across. So if you have troops that meet near Bernal, for example, let's have this. Uh, so this would be uh, just outside Bernal. So we got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, L27 is that hex and that's a small enough discrete enough area to think <clears throat> well okay if they both end up in that five mile across hex there's a you know there's more of a chance of them actually bumping into each other and so on and it's easier to track movement so troops can be given movement uh, abilities in hexes penalty movement penalties in hexes and so on and so forth you know there's a whole other podcast video thing to be done about creating campaign rules but my campaign rules benefited hugely the moment we moved from those rather vague squares to hexes okay so let's kind of uh, look at <clears throat> the next stage we've we've created here this is just Punkland over here, Fountainland over there. Oh, you might have already read the, this text, which is that um, the first thing that uh, I, as King Ludwig, decided to do was to start building canals to make north-south movement parallel to the Sturmwasser a great deal easier. Uh, canal routes proposed, it says here in red. Oh, my goodness me. And this is where I went mad about budgets and stuff. Cost at... 100 Pontlantala per hex uh, times 23 meant that the cost of the canal would be uh, 2,300 Pontlantala and the building time would be, uh, that looks like 40 something months. Wow. Yes, you can, you can really get into detail with this kind of stuff. Anyway, let's leave that behind and take a first look at... What, the kind of thing I love doing with imaginations, which is campaign diaries. Okay, uh, and these are the first two campaign diaries I created. Uh, so starting, I think, in in the in the year 1740, something like that, and the second one 1745 and onwards. Uh, these are just A4 books that you could buy from any stationers. Uh, um, with you know ruled pages as you'll see so that was kind of the first uh, th those are the covers of those books so let's have a look here when we open them up and the kind of stuff yes I know it's mad isn't it absolutely mad the kind of stuff that I love doing with imaginations uh, you're going to have to forgive me because any of you who speak German will immediately notice that some of the unit names are really very rude <laughs> so please my apologies to any children who may inadvertently be in the area uh, there are some quite rude German names in that list on the left hey ho um, it was a stage I went through it was kind of German punning um, again just kind of messing about with languages and a kind of uh, slightly raunchy jokiness because Punkland, this is the army of Punkland as it was first created and Punkland's a very pompous, raunchy, kind of Bavarian kind of place. That was my experience from my year abroad and so it was reflected in Punkland. Uh, I seem to remember that Fountainland, Fortel, they're all a bit more prim, but never mind. This is how it started you see it's page two of me thing how neat and tidy is that yeah i know all done with um 
with really nice ink pen. Um, that calligraphy was another thing. Calligraphy and smart handwriting was another interest I developed, funnily enough, at university. Um, but there we go. So I, I just I had a very neat mind at the time. So here's all the regiments. So there's like a uh, crikey twenty. Two, 22 regiments of infantry there. Uh, you can tell I was already beginning to suffer from me megalomania. Um, now, at the time, there's another little clue in there. Musketeer and Jaeger regiments have 600 men, 12 figures. So that's 1 to 50. Which immediately triggers my memory that back in the day, when I was kind of dabbling with this we were using the wrg 1685 to 1845 rules uh, which meant uh small units so you got more bang for your buck so if you bought a whole pile of as i had spencer smith miniatures it meant that you got a lot of units for your money um i now look at 12 man units and think you no, that's not what I want at all. I've completely changed and gone very much more for the old school look. But back then, I wanted to be able to portray all these units, if I possibly could, on the table. And the WRG rules meant that small units. Um, unthinkable from now to me. But, you know, there's a lot of you guys out there thinking, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? You know, you want big battles. One to 50. Why not? Um, and my answer is absolutely each to their own. My actual response would be I would rather to get more units on the table. I'd rather downscale and put the Spencer Smith on the shelf and take out my Heroics and Ross 1 300th or Pendragon 10 mil or whatever they might be so that I can have more miniatures in that same footprint on the table. That's a thing, isn't it? You know, that's a whole other debate, ladies and gentlemen. But the thing is, this is imaginations gaming. It's entirely likely that many of you listening to this, if you're thinking about imaginations gaming, you may be solo gamers. OK, or you might have, you know, one or two good mates who go, oh, yeah, I'm up for that. Um, so you will make an agreement amongst yourselves about what rules you want to use for the tabletop and so forth and the kind of unit size you want, the kind of scales you want on the tabletop and so on. But back then, WRG 1685 to 1845 was a rule set that I used quite a lot. Um, they're all right. They take some getting used to, but they're all right. So there's the Musketeer and Jaeger regiments, and you can see yeah, this is where more creativity comes in. Uh, you're talking about creating not just your own countries and naming them and raising the regiments and naming them, but also designing the uniforms. Now, this is something that not everyone likes. So this is where, for example, you might take the more Charles Granty route and say, well, my imaginary country of Flib Flab Fadongo is going to have the uniforms of the Neapolitans uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, which, let's face it, were pretty bonkers. <laughs> OK, this is one of the things that actually when you're creating an imagination, um, you think, oh, cracking, you know, that must be unique. You know, my idea is so stupid that would never have been done. And then you go looking through the historical <laughs> historical record of military uniforms. Wow. There's been <laughs> men have been sent to war wearing the most extraordinary things. I'll leave it at that. But in my case, um, whilst I clean my glasses, forgive me, uh, you'll see if I waggle my mouse up and down here, I went for a really simple system for the facing colours of my units to make them easily recognisable on the battlefield. And I simply went for the rainbow. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and then black and various other color combinations so that it was I could certainly tell at a glance 
you know, regiment number one von Eintopf, still my favourite regiment, with its red scarlet facings, through von Arschloch, von Probe, von Keinglück, von Schicksal, von Baumundkatz, von Neugewehr, von Tapfermann, von Keinfeig, von Cesspitz. That's not actually the German word for a cesspit, but it sounds like it ought to be, right? I just made it up. Von Lebkuchen, tasty. Von Steinmauer, von Nusstorte. Nusstorte, I have to tell you, is a Bavarian and Austrian and Swiss speciality. Delicious. Uh, von Nusstorte, von Vielficken, I'm not going to explain that. Von Neibab, von Bauchweh, which is a stomach upset. Von Chemizet, chemistry set. Von Bleifus, lead footed. Von Bieseltopf. Bieseltopf is, uh, what do we call them? A Gesunder. It's, uh, it's a pot for peeing in. Von Westfelsen. Von Waldstecker, von Forstkrieche. Now, a couple of names for Jäger, they're von Waldstecker. It's a bit like um, someone who hides in the woods. And von Forstkrieche, someone who creeps through the forest. There you go. You, you go to town. A bit of linguistic playing around nowadays with Google Translate. And uh, Apple's just done an app on the iPhone for translation. Wow, you can have fun. It's really, really easy to do. And fun. You know, you, it's, and it's for you. You just sit there having a giggle about the names you're giving your units. You don't have to go foreign, of course. There's a good mate of mine, Ian Burt. Hello, Ian, Essex boy. Um, and he and I have often, you know, he, he was one of the first people who joined in kind of the big eight and games I was organising. And he created uh, an outfit called the Gateway Alliance. Um which is a really interesting name, and I'll get you to explain uh, him to explain that to you at some point in the future. But his uh, units aren't Germanic or anything like that. They've all got kind of English names uh, with, you know, quite amusing names of commanders and stuff. Um, so he's had his own fun creating his own unit names and his own, you know, uh, facing colours, that kind of stuff, unit of coat colours and what have you. Um, but you can see the primary look here for Punkland is sort of actually Austrianish, white coats and what have you. Then a unit of mercenaries in there, von Westfelsen in indigo coats. And I'll remember one of these days why I did that. Um, Westfelsen, by the way, Westcliff. That's where I was brought up, Westcliff on Sea in Essex. After uniforms, of course. Your flags, and I was very precise, wasn't I? The flag measures three centimetres on the staff, 3.25 centimetres flying. So that's the actual model dimensions rather than the real dimensions. And I kind of wish, and maybe I will go back and just convert it all as if this was the journal or records of a real army unit and say basically it's six feet square or you know, two metres square or whatever. And there we go. My, another interest I have, heraldry. So here's, uh, you know, white Maltese cross on a background of the units facing colour. Regimental number in Roman numerals of gold is in each quarter. The centre is a disc of black surrounded by gold laurels on which is a gold crown and L cipher. L for Ludwig, King Ludwig of Frankland. Uh, the flag has a white sleeve, this bit, uh, with gilt retaining studs on a black staff. Love it. All this detail, because in, in my head immediately, you know, this is bringing them all to life. And of course, sensibly, Jäger regiments do not carry their colours in action. Then the next page, we've got Grenadier regiments, Leibgarder zu Fuß von Zwetschgen. Zwetschgen is like a plum. Because uh, you have a, this wonderful plum tart called Zwetschgen Darche, which uh, you can get in that part of the world. Von Dürrenmatt, von Vogeldach, von Warchen. A Warche, I should point out, is a slap. And von Letzten Enders, uh, the last resort, mercenaries. Um, and again, more details about the Grenadier regiments. And pointing out the Leibgarder is a bigger unit. Of course it is. You keep it up to strength, you know, like the Immortals. So that's 16 figures. And again, details of the colours, the Grenzer regiments. I think here I can see in the Grenzer regiments, I started honouring people I actually knew. Uh, some friends of mine, von Zelda, von Neuer, von Steinbach, von Dorendorf. These are all, it's just dawned on me, they're actually all really attractive women that I knew and befriended during my year abroad. Let's leave it at that, shall we? Um, 
here we go with the artillery now the artillery i i gave a kind of contrasting thing so they're wearing red coats with white facings uh individual battery crews are identified by lace on the lapels and color and i did it might the, the spencer smiths i've still got yes i can recognize all these uh the horse artillery differ they have bear skins batteries of eight guns and so on and so forth um so that's the kind of detail i went into and i still look at that and think my god i can't believe how neat and tidy that all is that's absolutely extraordinary let's have a look at uh another page what have we got here okay let's open this one and zoom in a bit oh my goodness me various commanders and equipment now this oh yes adding personality to your imaginations games now obviously if you're fighting a historical campaign you've got all the historical record about the personalities of the commander-in-chief and the, the divisional commanders and the brigadiers and all the way down to you know uh, lieutenant so-and-so and sergeant blogs right if you're doing an imaginary uh, an imaginary campaign you have to make it up um and i went for therefore uh, what some of you will instantly recognize is kind of the dungeons and dragons approach where i literally rolled up the characteristics of every one of my generals brigadiers and regimental commanders i went as far as that so starting on the left there's those musketeer regiments again von eintop von arschloch and so on and so forth and there in order under personality leadership as i waggle over here you can see intelligence initiative courage charisma strength and health okay so every time you want your commander at whatever level to do something or you feel like they need to make a decision about something you roll against their appropriate characteristic so von eintopf you can see that there's a cavalry charge coming will you prepare for it well roll a couple of percentage die if you roll 77 or less yes you are prepared if you roll more than 77 so 78 plus no you're not prepared and your unit is likely to get caught unawares and trampled to death uh initiative so for example uh if there's a situation where quite clearly you can see a threat coming from the flank. So are you going to wheel your unit to face that threat? Well, again, roll a couple of percentage die, 73 or less. Yes, you will. Above that, no, you won't. So this guy's pretty good in action. I think you can say von Eintopf, uh, with high intelligence and high initiative, he's a pretty effective combat commander. However, personal courage so would he actually put himself in the front rank and lead a charge or would he um you know sacrifice himself in certain situations mm, probably not so much actually maybe you know this is where you can start thinking about what physically does this guy look like maybe he's really quite small and timid maybe you know he's uh, he's lost a limb you know in a previous ex you know previous battle and therefore is less likely to want to endanger himself personally um but on extraordinary occasions he still might you know 24 or less yes he will lead that charge yes he will grab the colors and steady the unit you know um and his men love him 97 they'd follow him to the death so literally like you know this he's a, a situation where a unit might break roll against his charisma for rallying the men it's almost certain he will rally the men okay now his personal strength and remember these are all randomly generated this is how i just sat there one evening just rolling like a million percentage dice to come up with these okay but it's interesting how it works out isn't it his uh strength is identical to his courage so again this is like it's almost certain that maybe he lost a leg or something like that or he's been very ill he's had some kind of infectious disease you know in his youth or something so he's physically weak but there's still a chance that 
you know, in extremis, he may surprise everyone. Okay, he's not down at you know sub 10%, he's 24, so he's maybe he's kind of partially crippled. Maybe fell off a horse in an accident. We just don't know. But there we are. The, the stories already start appearing in your head, don't they? But finally, health, 88. He's actually pretty hard to kill. You know, he's... he's I, I, I've got a picture of him as this quite wiry guy. You know, he's he's he's, he's been through some rough times, physically, illness or whatever. But actually, he's... He's going to be hard to kill, right? He's not going to suddenly... And also, it means he... Because he, I had... And I'll explain the green crosses in, in a moment. You know, uh, there may be, as the umpire of a campaign... Oh, a pandemic. Ha <laughs> ha, pardon the pun. A pandemic sweeps Central Europa and you have to test whether your top people are going to survive it. He is more likely to survive it. Maybe he's built up an immunity, something like that. Because if we look at the next guy, Van Arschloch, who has a green cross next to his name, that means that at some point in the winter of 1740, 41, whatever, I, a, a random card was drawn, which said, basically, some kind of flu virus or something sweeps through the country. All your leaders must be tested against it. Von Arschloch didn't survive. Von Prober underneath him. Look at his health. Ten. No surprise that he dropped dead on the spot. OK. And in fact, Von Prober, that's probably for the best with. This is extraordinary. What a set of characteristics. 100 intelligence. The man's a genius. But initiative zero one. Don't ask him to ever make his mind up. <laughs> right. Personal courage, however. If given direction, look at the guy. Charisma, mm, not popular. <laughs> some extraordinary, and yes, some of them are, you know, you do get these extremes amongst some of your characters. But if you look down the rest of the characters, an awful lot of people with sort of average 71, 65, or well, good 158, 74, you know, it, it, it kind of comes out in the wash. So, yes, for every single one of these leaders, I rolled for their characteristics. And you can see if I'm heading over to the right hand page there, let's go further down. Even Pyre Regiment, Herr Lochge <laughs> Herr Lochgreber, Mr. Hole Digger, right? Uh, medical Regiment, Herr Dr. Blutstopfer, Mr. Bloodstopper, right? <laughs> oh dear, pardon me laughing at my own puns. But there we go. Uh, yes, we've got artillery batteries von Heiseisen, hot iron, von Traubenschuss, grape shot, von Ricochetsky. I don't think there's actually a word for for a ricochet, but it sounds like it ought to be, right? Von Kettenrocher, chain smoke. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Normal service will be resumed. Sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go down as well. Well, Commander in Chief. König Ludwig I von Punkland, he get he he escapes having these characteristics because he's me, right? Uh, were I just umpiring the situation, he would of course have characteristics. But because in my case I was playing King Ludwig I of Punkland, that poor guy gets whatever my characteristics might be judged to be, <clears throat> right? Uh, and then we have Lieutenant Generals of Infantry, of Cavalry, Artillery in the Grenze, and so on and so forth. And again, they all have their characteristics. And you can see, my goodness me, that pandemic really took its toll. That, you know, flu pandemic or whatever it happened to be, um, really took its toll. All those green crosses, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. So that's kind of another of the sections of creating an imagination that you can really have fun with. And these characteristics play a part whether you're talking about a battlefield situation, right? And it doesn't matter what rule set you're using, whether it's the WRG 1685, 1845, or Black Powder, or My Shot, Steel and Stone rules, or, you know, insert name of your favourite rule set. 
you can add so much flavor to your games by giving the commanders their own individual characteristics like this. The other systems exist, you know, card-drawn systems and so on. And in my forthcoming book, ladies and gentlemen, I promise I talk about those. But this is just a really simple one lifted from Dungeons and & Dragons and the world of fantasy gaming. And why not? And of course, they apply in campaign situations as well. You know, your general wants <coughs> uh, von Uradel of the first Carassias wants him to uh, march from point A to point B. Will he obey orders? Uh, will he feed back useful information to the commander? Well, this is a man with huge intelligence. So he might say, well, boss, general, your majesty, you've uh, asked me to march my men from here to there. Actually, um, I've had scouts out because I'm clever and we found an alternative route that's quicker or safer, you know. So you can use these characteristics to add a huge amount to your, both your games and your campaigns. Let me haul across another uh, page here because in, in these early days, um, yeah, lots of detail. I This is how I recorded dispositions at the beginning of each week and proposed movement for that week or whatever they're doing. So, for example, um, let's look down here. Um, here we go. Von Liebkuchen, 1st Battalion, is in I-35, the town of Klebrunn, and it's in the south wing attack via Bernau it's involved in. And it's 2nd Battalion. I've obviously doubled the size of the army here, haven't I? Because I've all suddenly got 2nd Battalion. I was in P-45 Kaufbeuren doing training. Oh, yes, I expanded the army. And one of my first orders was expand the army, double it. So all these 2nd Battalions are in training at this point. Um, uh, on the opposite page, you can see there uh, underneath the number 31 at the top. Weather for move one, fine and chilly. Wind south-southwest, light veering west. Light to moderate, force one. Forecast fine, possible showers. Oh my god! I was doing weather forecasts. I'd forgotten that. I seem to remember, yes, this was probably the first campaign year that Guy and I did. And I think we had everything but the kitchen sink in the campaign rules. Uh, hugely detailed. At the time, I again, I was just, it was obsessive. I must have had time on my hands. That's the first thing. Because I was sort of uh, running the campaign for Guy and I, and we were exchanging our you know, moves and stuff every week. Look at this. The Leibgard at Zerfuss, von Zweschen, von Dürrmann, von Vorgel, they're all in T-38 near Wilhelmsfort to be transported by water to Bernau. Barges! Oh yes, this is another aspect of 18th century warfare. And later. And Yes, just because it's a land campaign doesn't mean you have to move all your troops all the time by road. If there's rivers or canals, uh, it often happened that do you know what? Uh, get on the boat. <laughs> now, there was a limited number of boats. I think we limited the number of units that could be transported at any one time quite severely. But it really played a part. Uh, then we've got the, the Grenzers underneath that. And you can see, uh, wow, I've divided up the battalions into thirds, uh, company-sized border patrols. So each one of those battalions is actually... Uh, creating, let's have a look, yeah, F27, G27, H27, creating three coordinates. So when you send the, the position and report to the enemy, uh, they've got to guess what's going on because what you've done is you've created a screen by dividing up the unit into companies and sending them out like that. Each single unit is creating three coordinates. So your opponent's immediately thinking, oh, hang on a minute, I can't tell where they're... The, the bulk of their force is and suddenly there's all these more coordinates than inspected it's a great way of creating kind of fog of war if you don't have an umpire 
Uh, you can see all the cavalry underneath those and their coordinates. And uh, let's have a look. Von Maltusch and Dragoon, CC-27, poised to cross the Sturmwasser, in other words, to invade Falkenland, and head for DD-23 to prevent enemy reinforcements arriving. So presumably heading up a road to block off the enemy advance. Um, that's interesting. CC-27. Should we have a quick look at the map, ladies and gentlemen? Where was the map? uh no i haven't i haven't got the map page so but anyway there you go that's how it works uh, another one i love my language poised to raid mines at ff27 yes uh we had uh natural resources so coal mines iron ore silver gold even all these things and here we go all the artillery down the bottom and pioneers and the medical things are still in the capital h49 Bebersfort, all preparing to be loaded on barges which will require six for the artillery five for the rest total 11 of the 20 available barges in the capital and also at the bottom construction of wilhelms canal and wilhelmsfort begins barges for grenadiers to be collected at 38t i love this uh, this is bringing back so many memories i hope i hope you're not just sitting there thinking oh my god i hope he shuts up i did say i was going to be talking about this for a while um now then so that's the moves for each week so let's have a look here then the write-up of what actually happened in that week this is for later on this is for 16th to the 23rd of march 1742 uh, we rolled an intelligence roll each to see how much each of us might f find out. Guys, you can see, guys, intelligence roll 78. Sadly, quite good. This is on a pair of percentage dice, obviously. Unfortunately, that also means a great deal of paperwork for me. My elaborate plans of deception are becoming amazingly complex to the extent of sending a scout on in the same direction while the remainder of a unit doesn't about face and marches back. <laughs> just to keep a coordinate moving forward wow i have managed to send a large force up to d27 with a lot also near reichsmannshausen and bernau but the best thing is a good die roll which has allowed me to get five regiments of cavalry over the sturmwasser at d27 guy withdrew his detachment there southwards obviously satisfied with my initial declaration of just detachment not thinking i would shift as much as possible right up into the corner the oblique order in grand style plus von zelda grenzers have got there panting a bit and with a few stragglers but they're there 84 figures and more to come ta-da because um under the campaign rules we had certain things so it would be a you know a patrol a detachment a brigade uh, a division or a grand army something like that and so there were certain limits of figures uh, below which you could uh, declare something as one thing and above which you had to declare it as the higher total um it led to a lot of fun you know again it's ways of carrying out campaigns when you don't have an umpire um yes and then lower down the page you can see here um Oh, yes, we've got letters from Comte de Saint-Germain. Uh, so, he, you know, we have our spies. Um, contacts made on the move. So here's the coordinates. And this is what we found there, right? Um, so, yes, Guy has a cavalry detachment there. One of the other ways that we worked it was that whenever a contact was made, so we both bumped into each other in, let's say, hex uh q uh, 026 here we go there's 026 uh you would have to declare uh what it, you had in that hex so a detachment uh, and i might have a detachment as well uh and then you would have a role to see whether you found out any more and in this case it must have had a reasonably decent role because he had to tell me specifically that it was the tatiani huzaran in that hex uh, otherwise he might could have just said oh it's it's a detachment of hussars or just a detachment of cavalry right or even just a detachment you can't find out any more than that all right um and 
uh, even harder to find out specifics if you contact a garrison so x27 there's obviously a town or village or something and it's just been declared as a garrison okay um so then you know my own thoughts about what's going on and then my plans for the next move you know based on the information received and so the Foutland's actual coordinates that were confirmed there's guys coordinates and my interpretation of those coordinates right uh, and I was obviously feeling cocky at this stage. Was I like, like a dream come true? Guy has apparently moved south in most cases. It looks like he's stuffing troops into Reichmannshausen like nobody's business. Checking out my presence near Bernau. Moving to recapture Immenstadt. So obviously I've ca captured Immenstadt at some point. But he's pulled his troops off the northern hills and left them ripe for the picking. There we go. And so then more plans of my own and who I'm sending where. So there I are. So I used to love doing this stuff. Remember, also, ladies and gentlemen, this is in the days before the internet. So we were exchanging coordinates and stuff over the phone or by letter. Remember those letters, things that you would write on a big piece of paper and you know, blah 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 blah, and sign off. All the best, Henry, at the end, and you'd fold it up and you'd put it in an envelope. Remember those envelope, and then you'd 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 stick down the envelope and put a stamp on the front above the address, and you'd put it in a post box. And a few days later, if you were lucky, it would arrive at the other end. But actually, I remember that being thrilling. Because in the meantime, you'd have, it was much more, funnily enough, felt more historical for this period because there'd be a bit of an interval where, oh, don't know what the enemy's up to. Uh, oh, letters arrive. So it's like something's come in from your couriers who are out there doing, you know, the reconnaissance. Oh, let's have a look at the letter. And as you can see here, kind of debate a great deal. Think about um, and and, you know expend a lot of conjecture about what the enemy's up to and how should you respond or whether you should just kind of ignore what he's up to and pursue your own plan and what would you send where and how would you disguise what you're doing absolutely loved it obviously everything's a great deal more immediate now uh, i think of nick and richard uh, two fat lardies doing their discord campaigns which are kind of all happening live they're they're much more suitable for kind of uh you know 20th century onwards um you know, particularly world war ii onwards type campaigns where yes stuff is happening rapidly and you need to make decisions right now because the speed at which things are traveling and the speed at which the situation could change is extraordinary and so something like a discord campaign for the later eras is spot on but actually i've got a lot to a lot of affection for this kind of campaigning for earlier eras and of course if you're doing it solo you can take as much time as you like but I certainly used to love the rhythm where, you know, every, once a week or whatever, you know, a letter would arrive and, and it was just a really lovely experience. Um, but yeah, who, who sends letters anymore? So let's have a look. Um, what else was in this book? Oh, here we go. We've got some flags randomly decided whoops, to do flags for uh, Grinzer units. There we go. I just love heraldry and doing flags. I, it's... It's fun. That's something I, I'm going to do something for my patrons all about heraldry and making flags and that kind of stuff. So if you want to see me talk at more length uh, and do graphics and stuff uh, on the subject of kind of imaginations of flags and heraldry and stuff. Well, come and be a patron. What can I say? What else have I got in this uh, stuff? Oh, what we actually have in here. Oh, yes, we have an actual battle report, sort of. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, well, I was obviously cock a hoop about something, wasn't it? A momentous occasion. This is 1744. We jumped through here. This was in the little uh, state of Martinstadt. Um, and it's a Martinstadt and its capital, confusingly, Martinstadt. Um, 
concentration of forces around Martin Stad reaches its climax with over 800 figures, which in WRG terms is, what is that, 40,000 men ready to storm the walls? All I lack is the heavier guns. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I've resolved up to tricks here, scattering squadrons of Shapka around to produce an overdose of coordinates to confuse him. And then uh, here we are, without a shot being fired, Martin Stadt's fallen. After extensive negotiations with the Supreme Commander of the Garrison, he's evacuated the city in return for an honourable truce. Uh, there we go. Uh, and a rude word, which I won't uh, concentrate on. Yes, and a little diagram of what happened at some river crossing here uh, with uh, my Ulans and his Ulans kind of swapping sides of the river. Um, yes, action reports, that kind of stuff. This is the kind of thing that we like to do. Um, me working on... So this is we're through to 1745 now. So this is me working on uh, a, a slight revision of the uniforms. Uh, and I'd set aside a huge chunk of the book to do this. And I only in the end did the first couple of regiments. Um, but there we are. That's If you've ever seen pictures of my Fon, Fon Eintopf musketeers, that is indeed what they look like. Um, what else do I bung in a book like this? Here we go. Here's a list of battle honours. Engagements of the wars of the Faltinian succession. So here we go. These various uh, encounters. Um, and who won? And after a shaky start, there's a lot of Prunkland victories in there. Um, looks like in 1743. Oh, yes, I suffered a few defeats there. Uh, guy's hands, but I'm delighted to say that if you tot up the number of victories for Prunkland, the number of victories for Fountainland, the best side comes out on top. What can I say? Um, let's have a look here. This is um, one of the weekly campaign maps. This is in uh, ah, this is in Martinstadt, Martinstadt, because there in the middle is Martinstadt, and you the, the 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 red hexes are my troops and the blue hexes are guys troops the Fountainlanders. we'd we'd i think we got frustrated at some point about trying to fight a war across the river be uh, the river sturmwasser that divides Fountainland and prunkland and so um we kind of moved on to what should be neutral territory poor little martin start um became a battleground just like the netherlands in the real you know well in many wars uh going all the way back to marlborough and the 30 years war and before so um yes here we are in neutral martinstadt kind of uh marching around one another but this is also i think shows this big chunk of my troops that have managed to kind of isolate the capital city and there's guy in the kind of outer ring realizing too late what i've been up to because i use barges to bring troops up the river and suddenly like woof, okay deal with that sunshine uh and we did one of these every week so we'd I'd mark the coordinates on the map and in fact there'd be two maps there'd be the where we intended to be and then the final as you can see at the top there actual finish positions so that was the actual finish positions at uh, week five at the end of week five uh, and I've managed to kind of get in amongst him so I was really pleased about that give me interior lines and so on moving on in maps because obviously these are the overall campaign maps then what I did and still do uh, when there's an encounter in a hex if both sides decide uh, either yeah, I'm going to stand my ground and fight here. Or, uh, oh, yeah, can I see some more detail before I make a decision about whether to stay in this hex? Well, I create, no surprise, hex maps. And here we are back to lovely tracing paper again. So on the left, this hex here is, well, it's the capital of Martinstadt. It's Martinstadt with all its Vauban redoubts and so on. That's a pretty formidable place. So you can understand why I was pretty cock-a-hoop about it falling without shot. 
<laughs> that could have been an absolute bloodbath because not only has it got all these uh, redoubts, numerous redoubts around it, uh, it's also got one of these humongous citadels as well. Think of a city like Lille, right? That's a major undertaking to try and take down a place like that. Major undertaking. Um, and that, you know, this is, again, I just me with, well, first with a pencil and then over going over with a, a mapping pen um, on tracing paper. The idea, again, being that if you build up this network of stuff on tracing paper and you can just lay them next to each other if you get to the point where you've got uh, adjacent hexes having been mapped in detail and even though I can now do it all on computer I still do it on tracing paper like this I just love creating these detailed little maps and again of course the challenge is it's not just the big towns now it's the tiniest little hamlets and things let's let's uh let's go over to this one which is uh that looks like that could be uh moving into uh fountainland of prongdown that's the river steinwasser down the middle there so let's have a zoom in a bit in the map on the right um don't know how oh, it's still a bit fuzzy to be honest but you can see all these little <laughs> hamlets you know, just a clutch of buildings. Um, some of them have got the most fantastic names. I can't quite make that out, but it's, it looks like it's something like Niedertal Zumpfenshausen or something like that. Um, Reichenstein and, and so on and forth. Plankstetten. I think Plankstetten's another place in Bavaria, actually, or Swabia. Um, so that's something I loved and still love doing is creating these hex maps they're about uh, 10 centimeters across and you can see from the scale there i think it's from side to side that represents five miles so they're five miles five miles square five miles hexagonally <laughs> okay um let's have a look at what else another oh is this the the martinstadt one? Oh, there you go you see more clearly there, Attenkirchen, Trochtefingen, uh, Hügelbrand, Friedelfing. I just, I've really got a thing about German. Glut. Notice the Jumnaus. The Jumnaus are important here. Uh, Bisch, what's that? Bischofswiesen, uh, Oberfels, Löchgau. Love it. Some of these may be real place names. Apologies to the residents of these places, but some of them quite clearly are just made up. Cobbled together with lots of glottal stops. And there's the River Steinwasser running through. And of course, yes, you can get into as much detail as you'd like about the city. And uh, we've got St. Ignatius Docks uh, and Vand is that Van der Valk Promenade or something like that? Well, we all know where Van der Valk's a TV series, isn't it? But I have huge fun doing this. If you're a solo gamer, obviously, um, I think of people like um, uh, Sid, Sidney Roundwood, known for his work with Two Fat Nardies, who loves doing this kind of stuff. He, he, he goes slightly different. He gets out his watercolours and does little kind of landscape and of of his places and elevations of buildings and that kind of stuff which uh i also want to do i mean i have to say that you know he it's just that he's gone about things in a slightly different way i've gone mad on the detail of you know the mapping of fairly sizable areas if this you know five by five wasn't 25 square miles or something like that um, whereas i think um, Sid kind of talks more generically about regions and then focuses in, in on a particular place and its buildings and its people wearing clogs and that kind of stuff. Wonderful. But, you know, you, the choice is yours. You know, this is my madness. You choose your own madness. If you want, don't want to do this much detail, fine, skip over it. Um, but as something, particularly during, you know, the COVID crisis, as a way of totally losing yourself in in a world of your own creation 
it it's I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Uh, we're getting through these images. This is a, oh here we go. A couple more example hex maps. Uh, let's zoom in a bit. Here we are. It's another fortress. It's, so this is Niflgletsch. Uh It looks a bit distorted because the camera was at a funny angle. Uh, again with a huge citadel. And look at the position of this. This is kind of a mountain top fortress. Uh, with all these hills and valleys around it. My goodness me, I wouldn't want the job of trying to besiege that. That's for certain. Um, a place you'd probably want to bypass. But at the same time, you know, it's on, it's got these main roads converging there, and it's like, well, depending on which, where your campaign's going, it might be, uh, you know. You, you've got to deal with it. Uh, interesting features here where I think this is a co what you would call a coal lake here, where you've got what was could have been an old voca volcano or something that's collapsed in on itself, and you have a lake in the old crater. Um, yeah, great fun, you know, discovering geography, geolo geology lessons about terrain and stuff. And I obviously went mad. You can see here the fleshes. Uh, I clearly went a bit bonkers on this one, didn't I? Um, great fun, though. And here we have uh, keys. I always put a key on. There's a marsh, stream leading to lake, and so on. And this is a uh, the town plan of Schmickelhof, which featured, hex W31, which featured in a kind of last stand game, as I recall. Um, so the town itself, you know, this is basically the table layout. This is, uh, where all the buildings and everything were in much greater detail. Um, and again, you know, this is something else I love doing is battlefield maps. And this is, you know, one way of doing it again, all with the mapping pens, folks, all done in the days before I, uh, had access to m much more powerful computers. So this would have probably been 1990-ish, mm, 91 maybe, something like that. Um, again, we've got a more detailed view of Niflgletsch, just so you can see that a bit more clearly. Um, I think there might be a few bits of Tipex happening in there. <laughs> Do you remember Tipex? Typewriter correction fluid. Wonderful stuff, Tipex. And what else have we got here? This next picture. Oh, here we go. Some more maps with... Oh, yes, here we go. The the Ehrenberg encounter. This is a, a, a game. A report of a game. Look at that. Because now, nowadays... Well, first of all, you too, you can see here what I've been talking about. I'm pointing with my finger. That's no good. A point with the pointer. You see where you've got one hex map adjacent to and overlapping its neighbor. Okay. Um, which I kind of love. I love that. Um, and the game report, the written game report, because nowadays, of course, we are so used to just click 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 away with our phone digital photos you know because most of us now have even abandoned digital cameras as it were you know i've got quite expensive what was a quite expensive digital camera hiding around the corner but it, it's so bulky whereas you know if, if i hold this up to the screen you know most of you have got something like this you know an iphone which has got an incredible camera in it not just for stills but for video too and works amazingly even in low light whereas back in the day this is kind of old-fashioned battle reports isn't it actually writing up what happened on pieces of paper with maps that we had drawn but there's something you know if this is nostalgic i think it's a kind of wonderful nostalgia because i find you know the fact that i've still got these things um, they're precious to me they mean so much because of the effort that I put into doing them. Um, what happened in this encounter? 
Uh, yes, in fact, here we go. I think it was General Slim. Oh, 1992. There you go. First, 4th of February, 1992. So I had been a graphic designer for ooh, about nine months at this point. Um, and my my computer was a tiny little Apple Mac SE with a 10 inch screen, a 10 inch black and white screen. I didn't get my first color Mac. I think it was until the end of 1992. Um, but yes, a nice quote. I think it was General Slim who once remarked that all battles of significance in World War II took place at night in the rain and at a place where two maps joined. I can only concur with his judgment. Um, so here we are. We have von Wachtgrenzers advancing in a northwesterly direction to P-41, where they had intended to stay put for the rest of the week. They arrive in the Hex in the vicinity of Ehrenburg on the morning of Thursday, the 2nd of April, 1745. Waiting for them are the enemy in the form of the Faltinian Grenzers Hefer and Dragoons Junker. Putting all the cards on the table, this makes the following forces. Prunkland, 40 Grenzer figures. Fountainland, 40 Grenzer figures. And 48 Dragoons figures now you can tell immediately we've changed rule sets we're not using wrg 1685 to 1845 rules anymore and you're going to shriek when i tell you that i seem to recall we had graduated if that's the right word to the newbury rules <laughs> i can no, I, i'm block my ears the shrieking's terrible but yes the newbury uh seven years war 18th century rules i can't remember what the title actually was uh trevor Horsall was the author very highly detailed and instead of infantry being one to 50 uh i think it was something like one to 20 uh yeah and it was one of those rule sets where you had to keep tally of actual men casualties Let's leave it at that. But anyway, here we go. We've got the characteristics of the commanders. Remember me talking about the characteristics of the commanders? And my comments here. So, von Wacht. Ach! Von Hefer. Hmm. Uh, thick as two short planks, von Hefer. Five intelligence. But great initiative. Uh, von Juncker. Oh, yes. Not a bad commander. Oh, look, he's got a hundred in there, hasn't he? For courage. Uh, and there's the sheets of the actual full report. What can I say? I'm, uh, you know, still having stuff like that in my archives. I'm really happy about. Uh, yeah, I've talked for an hour and 20 minutes. What can I say? I hope you're still with me, folks. <laughs> Suddenly, colour. Ooh, ah. This is the original map of Martinstadt hand colored in watercolors wow watercolors and colored ink pens for the roads uh i rather like that it's got quite a nice subtle effect but it's actually you know it that's like i say it's real watercolor water brushes paint um and i obviously did it quite carefully but i think it's created a rather lovely effect and a very dramatic change from having seen everything in black and white up to now. You're probably thinking there was something. Do not adjust your set. The things I've been showing you have actually been just in black and white until this point. Okay. So there we go. That's kind of another move on. Um, and that was done for the campaign year 1744. I can see down the bottom here. Um, it's rather, I just, I rather love that. You know, and there's all the mountains and rivers and everything uh, shown and labelled. And obviously, you know, the, the height increase from green through uh, buff through kind of, what's that, B burnt sienna kind of colour uh, through to purple. And even a bit of white for the very summits, icy summits of the tallest peaks. Um, there we are. So that's another way of... Mm, you like humanizing maps so even if you're using hexes and even if you're um computerizing stuff you can always print out a black and white version and then color it in by hand 
as a thing to pin on your wall as your master map or, or whatever, or then rescan that back in and digitize the, the color image. Um, you know, I, I, what can I say? I love doing this kind of stuff. So I'm going to, that's kind of the earlier Wars of the Faltinian Succession stuff. And I wanted to kind of uh, move on a bit. I'm closing up some windows here, as you can see, getting back to Photoshop thing. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the later stuff. And in fact, I'm going to show you um, some well, the stuff from 2018, the, the big Aiton campaign that uh, we did based on uh, the, um, yeah, where has it gone? Dali Chindrastan stuff. Let me give you, because this is a big map. This is a map. This is a map that got out of control this is a very very big file i'm about to open up here i hope i've got enough ram operating to do it you can see oh it's going to take a while to open folks uh 372 megabytes mm -hmm. let's update the text layers uh where's me there's my mouse i've lost my mouse update right this was mad <laughs> this is for one of the later i'm showing this by contrast think of all those lovely simple almost homey maps i did for the early kind of wars of the faltinian succession stuff that i was doing with guy and then after a number of eight and weekend events of increasing complexity um I ended up here. This also coincided with all. Oh, well, I was in the, already writing my wargaming campaigns book. So wouldn't it be good if I came up with a map where I could demonstrate to the reader how to create a map like this? Um, and the map I imagined creating was a lot smaller. <laughs> this got so bonkers that I had to put out a call to uh, m people on Twitter, people who follow my app battle games on Twitter, I had to put out a call for suggestions of place names, many of which flooded in, some of which were a little fruity, um, but many of which have actually made it into the final version here. So this was created in 2018 in time for the Dahlia Chindrastan uh, Aiton weekend which I've talked about before but today we're talking just about imaginations and what provokes you to do something like this Henry. Well you can first of all tell that it's not a European place right. The inspiration came because I was thinking what I what we wanted was another colonial style of, you know, gaming weekend um, and somewhere different from the bizarre beer that we'd already fought over a couple of times um, and would allow the creation of some more just completely bonkers stuff. And would be a challenge for me to create a continent and, you know. And so I decided on something that was much more kind of, you can know, Indian subcontinent-ish, right? And so I came up with this. I came up with Dahlia. You know, this is the main chunk here. And Chindrastan. So right at the top, you can tell there's a sort of ish Himalayas ish kind of range of mountains. And we'll zoom in in a bit. Ranging from, you know, the cold, bitter cold north and, you know, oxygen draining mountains right at the top down through a range of climate areas to, uh, you know, a hot, wet, monsoony south. And you can see I've, I've gone really. <laughs> Let's zoom in. Should we zoom in, ladies and gentlemen, on the 
scale. So you can see that that length there is a thousand kilometers. So uh, each of these squares is basically a hundred miles square. This is an extremely large place. Uh, and when it came to the campaign, it became obvious, you know, the job of the umpire is, well, OK, we've got two lots of people, some who are already there and another lot arriving with their allies and what have you. This is such a big place, they could easily get lost and never <laughs> encounter one another. So there needed to be some umpire fudging, if you understand what I mean by that, where I worked hard to make sure that they would bump into one another. As it was, there were still some minor problems, but never mind. So what we have is, uh, in, through the middle here, we have this, uh, uh, the bottom line is kind of the equator. You can see the red dash line across there. So we have the Tropic of the Goat <laughs> up here. So uh, this was in honour, it has to be said, to Simon Tonkis, known as Goat Major, top bloke. Uh, who made a lot of very good suggestions as well. Now, an awful lot of these places are in honour of war gamers. So here we are. Simon gets another mention here. The Straits of Tonkissia. Well, Simon Tonkis. Uh, we've got Siggins Bay. Hello, Mike. Maybe you're watching. Uh, we've got Mersey Bay, as in Dan Mersey. Uh, we've, who else have we got here? We've got the McFarlane Straits, Duncan McFarlane. Priest Point, an old chum of mine, John Priest. <laughs> Wesencraft Head, named after Charlie Wesencraft. Uh, and Cape Grant, Essex Bay, named after Essex Boy, Ian Burt and so on if you if you search at your leisure you will find there's a lot of well-known war gamers who have been uh, well i would like to say honored they might not feel the same <laughs> right then it became a part <coughs> a question of wow i don't speak any indian languages so i came up with as many kind of if you like Indian sounding, Urdu uh, sounding names as I possibly could. And then, as I said, I put it out to tender. I said to the Wargaming community, help. And some of them came back with, you know, great, great names. And they have been, you know, up the top here. Jelly Bean, Mandy Pandy, Bumbai, right? There's a lot. Some of them are close to the knuckle, but many are just silly, which is lovely. Let's zoom in. Right. I'm going to zoom in to this is this is 100 percent scale. This is kind of the size I was working at. And if I zoom in even more, you can see that this is a highly detailed, high resolution map. And it's the first time I'd done, I'd really gone for a proper atlas style where the layers kind of blend into one another. And it looks like you've opened a page of a proper atlas. Um, yeah, lots of names here that I'm just, I'm remembering as I'm looking at them, who suggested them and or who they were in honour of. Uh, Annie Cush, that's my Annie. That's my Annie, that is, Annie Cush. Uh, Nora Cush, that was my mum, in honour of my mum. Um, and many have... Yeah, <laughs> Vully Jumper. <sighs> Who suggested that? Um, some of them are more obscure. Pickledom. I like it. But yeah, coming up with the general geography... I still started with a pencil sketch. The absolute basis of this. Um, oh, crikey, I can see. Uh, I wonder if I can bring that. I can, I'm going to bring a layer to the top because it says original drawing. So I assume. Let's put that top then. All right. I'll put that right at the top. You can see, if I increase its opacity, give it a second, there's a big farm. 
14th of February 2017. That was the original pencil sketch of Dahlia and Chindrastan that then became that. I'm pretty pleased with that. I think that that transformation is fairly dramatic. And as you say, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it, I, I treated this like an atlas. So there's all the border provinces, the actual feet and meters height scale. Um, and it was a, an immense challenge. I mean, this was all, all the stuff on top was done using a, a graphics tablet and, uh, and stylus. Um, and it took a long time. You know, this is this is kind of the the extent you can take your madness to if you really want to. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but it provided some great gaming for you know a very short campaign for the for the um, Aiton weekend in 2018, and. We've hardly scratched the surface. The action for that campaign all took part sort of in here. I think somewhere I may have uh, the bit of the map. Yes, here we are. We've got a bit where we've zoomed in. Again, big file. So, yes, update. So, yes, here we go. The actual campaign focused entirely on this area with some troops, the receiving troops, if you like, uh, garrisoned in this region and uh, the enemy, the, the Grand Wissian Alliance, who I always think of as the baddies, arriving by sea from vast distances away vast distances away, beset by storms and pirates and all sorts of things happened to them on the way. But they eventually made it there and then had to march to find the enemy. And this is kind of the area where the the battles took place. Now let's have a look. Oh yes, zoom in even further. Yep. So here we go. Now we're zooming in even further. And now, ladies and gentlemen, can you see the extent of my mag madness? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I overlaid the hexes, which, as you know from what we've looked at earlier, each of these hexes is five miles across. So, you, yeah, because each of these squares is like 100 miles, so that's 20 by 20 hexes in each of those squares. And, wow. <laughs> More names appearing, like Protz, in honor of Bill Protz. Hello, Bill, if you're watching. And Gandiapur, Nan Bredabad, oh, really, yeah, some really ease, <laughs> he's a geezer. Oh, dear, dear, dear. But there we are. This is, you know, having been all excited about German, start, you know, wait until you start looking at kind of, non-European languages, as I'm now doing with fleshing out my Bizarbia for the Bizarbia uh, Bathalas Ancients campaign, uh, dabbling with Arabic. Um, but this is where you can go, ladies and gentlemen. This, These are, you know, imaginations don't have to be European. And of course, I've shown you all stuff. This is Indian subcontinent. This map we happen to be using it for kind of 18th century colonial stuff, could be used for 19th century colonial stuff, could be used for modern wars. I mean, all the stuff that's happened between India and Pakistan and so that sort of vibe. Um, it's up to you. You know, so you, at the moment I'm, you look at a map like this and you're seeing it in terms of, oh, you know, well, OK, we've arrived by sailing ship. Where would we uh, dock or moor to disembark the troops? How far could they move, march in a day and so forth? But in a modern context, that changes completely. You're looking for, OK, where could I safely land airborne forces uh, you know uh, parachute drops or gliders or helicopter borne troops um what's the reach of missiles uh where would the navy go what's the where's the danger of running aground could we get submarines in there and 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 where would you send in drones 
you know, that's the opposite end of the scale or in, a, in an ancient context, you know, are there any spare elephants running around? Um, it, it's entirely up to you that cr creating the map is one thing. How you use it is limitless. You know, you and I'm sure for my Wars of the Faltinian Succession, which are currently now like 1750, 1752, something like that, the maps will evolve and be used in different ways as we move through to the 19th century and the 20th century. And, you know, could be used in a fantasy context, a mythological past, could be used in a sci-fi context, you know. Um Let's, I'm going to do one more zoom in if I'm able to. Yes, here we go. Uh, you might be able to hear my cat shouting at me. But um, here we go. This is now focusing right in on the area where the actions took place in this area between Mount Samar and Mount Kulfi around Currybard. Fizipop, the defense of Fizipop. I'm going to hold up a book I actually created. Ugh. And this is something else you can do for your for yourself. I created a book, a photo book. I think this was done via Snapfish. They're online. A book of photographs commemorating the defense of Fizzy Pop. And there, I waggle it. There's Fizzy Pop there in the Curry Bad Pass at the edge of the forest. There, right? This is a lovely way to commemorate your games, um, and you don't have to spend fortunes. I think uh, the production costs for this were thirty something pounds each, which is it's not cheap, agreed, but um you know and even some of the reprobates who took part in the game are, are represented in this book right um it's not for on general sale but it, as a way of commemorating games and campaigns that you fought with your mates that's something else you can do nowadays right goodness me to have to have had that done in the old days when it was all kind of litho print and they said, oh, minimum of 100 copies and it's going to cost you five grand, Gov. Now, no, it's just literally print on demand. And I did recently, you know, half a dozen of the guys said, oh, yeah, I'll have a copy because Snapfish was doing an offer and it, you know, brought the price down considerably. And so, you know, you can get half a dozen printed off for your mates um and they just chip in with that what a lovely memento your own little coffee table book memory of a lovely time and that is definitely my cat shouting so um i, I think the thing is that i'm getting disturbed here so that's chuffy down there that's one of my cats who's very noisy um and <laughs> is very needy so <laughs> that's almost time to wrap up folks i think um I just hope that that's given you a, some just some ideas about how you can uh, create your own imaginations, map them out, um, write about their history, their uniforms, their commanders, give them personality, that kind of stuff, and flesh everything out to make the imagination seem as if they're as real as a historical campaign that you would read about in history books. Um, because you've got completely free reign. Um, one thing I would say is that it's very easy. <laughs> I presented the evidence. Below. It's very easy to get completely carried away with this kind of thing. Um, and I think that's something you do need to guard against. You don't have to go to these lengths that I go to, but, you know, you can confine it to um, a really small area, for example. You don't have to create a vast subcontinent that's thousands of miles across, as I've done. It could be, you know, a couple of villages 
next to one another. It could be uh, a, a couple of counties. Think of the English Civil War, where you've got people in, people in one county who are royalists and the uh, people in the adjoining county are uh, parliamentarian. And you've got you know a couple of lords with their own regiment of foot and perhaps a few dragoons or horse, maybe a gun or two. And that is the extent of the opposing forces. And you can have a huge amount of fun at that kind of level or a skirmish level. Crikey, you know, two fat lardies. Sharp practice or chain of command where you've got two, uh, you know, could be, uh, say, Germans coming up against the French in 1940. It could be the British against the, the French in the peninsula in, you know, 1808 or 1809, something like that where you've got uh, relatively small forces who just keep rubbing up against one another because of the territory they're in and, you know, partisans and guerrillas, that kind of stuff. Really small numbers of people slash miniatures involved, um, certainly under 100. And you can have a cracking game on that basis. Um there's there's a huge amount of information out there about these little mini campaigns and uh, it just comes down to how much you want to invest of yourself and of your time um into these things um what i'm going to do just to kind of round up just uh, having talked about um creation of uniforms and, and that kind of stuff. Let me just bring up some pictures of is it going to open in a second? They're thinking about it, thinking about it. Here we are. <coughs> My Regiment von Eintop. Um this what they were originally painted for the Sitang bad game that me and the guys put on at um funnily enough, I think it was the other partisan way back in mm, two thousand and Eight or something. Um, designing these uniforms uh, and producing a unit like this to fight in games on the table was an absolute joy. And I think for many of us, when we're thinking about imaginations, uh, the game's the thing. That our first thought is... I want to create pretty armies in whatever scale is your preference to fight on the tabletop. And having them look good and resplendent like these guys um, is perhaps the most important thing. Um, I think this is partly because from my point of view, I, I love painting miniatures. It's one of the things I love doing. Actually, painting Spencer Smith to this standard is quite a challenge. And there's uh, I'm going to be doing something for my patrons explaining how I did this. Because um, I haven't painted them, as you can see, just a sort of toy soldier standard. I actually did a version of Kevin Dalimore's, you know, base coat and a couple of highlights on these boys because spencer smiths um have next to no detail on them whatsoever so any detail they get you've got to paint onto them which is a big challenge i can tell you that this was a, a labor of love painting these but i love doing it you may not your mileage may vary you may not love painting miniatures and therefore it's the other aspects of imaginations campaigning the stuff that's literally in your head that you can put down I love putting things down on paper, but you might like just entering stuff into an Excel spreadsheet or doing Microsoft Word documents or, or whatever it is, uh, and then grabbing images off the internet. You know, that may be your shtick. You may feel that actually doing artistic stuff, as it were, is beyond you. That's fine. It's your imagination. So you do what you want to do. You know, whatever you think... I, but what I think is important is that you create stuff that in years to come, you will look back on with affection. And it's like everything to do with a hobby. The more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. And 
you know i'm in my case you know here I am. i've been sitting here looking showing you stuff some of which i created back in the 1980s and i've still got it tucked away gathering dust somewhere I must get it all sorted out one of these days but rediscovering stuff that i did back then is an absolute joy you know i can happily while away an afternoon just looking back through stuff that i did that brings back memories from decades ago games that i played that are pretty much forgotten um and i mean obviously it doesn't have to you can do that for all your war game it doesn't have to be just imagination stuff i just think that imaginations give you the opportunity to do more of that stuff i think that because it's wrapped up so much more with your own creativity your own sense of style your own sense of aesthetics your own abilities as a writer or or cartographer or whatever it happens to be i mean you've seen here that there's so many aspects uh to imaginations that typify our hobby you know i always bang on about you know it's such a creative hobby it involves so many different aspects uh i was on a podcast recently um and uh the host said yeah it's more like a lifestyle than just a hobby and i think he's right you know there's there's just such a huge amount of stuff involved that it, it becomes a lifestyle it's not just um putting figures figures on a table and shoving them around and rolling dice it can be that if that's what you want it to be but i think for most of us it's more than that and i think for some of us it's a great deal more than that i mean i just look at this photograph here you know i created the backdrop on a my apple mac i made that house oh my goodness me donkey's years ago out of balsa wood and it's one of those charles grant houses where you can lift the top off and there's the ruins inside and you know the spencer smiths i've had those spencer smith miniatures for a long time they're the original plastic spencer smiths that i'd painted in humbrol enamels years ago when i was playing with the wrg rules and for that sitang bad game at partisan i stripped all the paint off those and they were soaking in terps and whatever for weeks stripped all the paint off trimmed them up cleaned them up and then repainted them all using acrylics um and that involves a many different skill sets and i look at them now and think wow they look really lovely they look really lovely and i invented the uniforms you know i did all the work putting them together and so forth putting them on parade took the pictures um i'm really proud of that and i think this is uh something that's important i think imagine you know imaginations are give you something that you can be proud of uh, give you the opportunity for for you to achieve stuff that's of real personal significance to you and i think in many ways it doesn't matter whether anyone else likes what you've done it doesn't matter if anyone else thinks oh my good you know why would you waste your time inventing stuff when there's so much real history out there if, if real history is their shtick, that's fantastic. But for someone like me, who imprinted on that famous book, The War Game by Charles Grant, back in 1971, I was shown by that man that you can take real history and just tweak it slightly. It's called, it's Ruritanian is the word, Prisoner of Zender. Prisoner of Zender is a classic example set in a slightly later era, you know, 19th century era, where in the middle of, you know, a real europe that's uh bellicose and troubled and all the rest of it the author created this tiny little place that has a life all of its own that never really existed but you kind of feel could have existed you know and brought it to life and i think that's the thing with me that in my head fountainland and prunkland and all the other countries around them borgenmark and schwitz and granuis and Grand Prix and Gelderstadt and all the others that have, you know, joined in since I first started, um, they have a kind of reality 
they have a presence in my life that keeps drawing me back to them you know i i always do you know when everyone's like i've i've been talking to my patrons lately and some of them say oh yes i quite like to hear more about your imagination stuff and that's kind of given me the incentive first of all to do this on that subject to get my juices flowing but it also has this maybe think well yeah actually there's a whole bunch more of stories i haven't yet told of characters yet to appear on the stage of battles to be fought of canals to be dug of windmills to be built of continents to be explored of politics to you know rattle backwards and forwards uh potential rebellions and revolutions and 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 off it spins and suddenly you realize that when you indulge in imaginations regardless of the period of history it's truly creative you're you're effectively uh well, you're writing stories, you're creating stories, you know, and at the end of it, you could end up with something that could be the basis of a, of a novel, of a Ruritanian novel, or, you know, not necessarily Ruritanian, if you'll think, because there are guys out there, let me just point out, for example, Pear Broaden, High Pear, who has created this fictitious scenario where the Germans, at the beginning of the Second World War, decide, all. Oh, we're a bit troubled by Sweden and its neutrality. We're going to take it out. And so suddenly you've got Germans fighting Swedes. And of course, it didn't happen in reality. But Pear has, oh, now that's interesting. Well, what if, right? Imaginations is all about what if. What if, you know, because Europe, this polyglot mixture of tiny principalities and dukedoms and bishoprics and what have you that existed as a, you know a, an, an, an ununified a disunified mess for such a long time well you know who's to say that there wasn't a little punk land or fountain land in the middle of it all you know, when you look at some of the real history of some of those places and their tiny armies that you know they weren't big enough to have an army of their own, as it were, so they contributed units to the bigger places, to the Prussias and Württembergs and what have you, this world. Extraordinary. Um, when you think of, you know, the Africa, because I know I'm, I'm going to have to forgive, I've forgotten names here at the moment. I, I know there's at least one person out there who's doing... Uh, kind of uh, Africa, Angola type conflict um, between black African nations, which is very unusual. Bravo. And why not? When you think of, you know, the breakdown of the Soviet Union and, and the fighting between various Russian states, you could easily recreate something along those lines. Or as I'm doing, as Tony Barth and a lot of war gamers of his day did back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, I'm, I've started my own Bathalus, bath, put my teeth in, Bathalus campaign, as in Tony Barth, based on his Hyborian campaign. So ancients gaming set in a you know in a fictitious world again more map making for me i love more map making right i'm happy about that so anyway i just want to hope i've kind of showcased to a certain extent my passion and excitement for imaginations gaming and the opportunities it gives you to do something uh completely new um something completely that's an adventure something that's um has no limits for you i think that's you know another way to put it is a way of uh creating your own worlds your own peoples that have no limits you can do with them exactly what you want and no one can criticize you for it because it's your world you know and that's a wonderful opportunity to do stuff 
So the last image I'm putting up here is my ancient world of Bathalus with the various hordes around it, around the Barkeries Sea, which I hope that some of you will appreciate. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks so much for supporting Partisan in the Cloud. And of course, we all hope that next year you won't have to put up with listening to me blather on. You can go to the real Partisan shows in May and October and meet with real war gamers rather than virtual ones at a distance and get to see and play some real war games in the company of real war gamers in uh, what we hope by then will be a safe and happy environment for us all. So stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for watching. Take care.